Hello and good morning everyone. And welcome to this session where we're going to talk about the business impact of code quality. And this is a pretty broad topic, so I'd like us to approach it from the lens of technical depth. And we're probably all familiar with technical depth, and we take on technical depth for multiple reasons. The classic case is that we try to go faster, we try to trade quality for delivering our feature quicker, right? So now our code is in a worse place than it used to be. Or perhaps we do everything right, but our understanding of the business problem we're trying to solve changes, so our design is no longer a good fit. Or maybe, just maybe, our design wasn't a good fit to start with. No matter where we come from, with the passage of time, those differences tend to lose their meaning, and we simply end up with technical depth being code that's more expensive to maintain than it should be. And this is the definition of technical depth that I'm going to use and run with throughout this presentation. Now, if you've been following the research over the past years, there have been some pretty interesting papers published that can actually quantify the impact of technical depth. And depending on which paper you look at, you're going to see different numbers, of course. But it doesn't really matter because they all kind of represent a pretty depressing read. Because depending on those papers, you will see that we software developers, we waste on average 23 to 42 percent of our work week dealing with the consequences of technical debt and bad code in general. 42 percent waste. What does that actually mean? Let's do a small thought experiment. Let's say that we have an organization with 100 engineers. With a 42% waste, we will get the equivalent output of just 58 people, right? Does that sound like a good deal to you? No, of course not. And I have to admit that that estimate of 58 people is probably overly optimistic too, because if we could do something with 58 people, it's always going to be cheaper and more efficient than having 100 people do the same job due to the increases in coordination and communication overhead, right? So I like to think that that number of 42%, it's actually overly optimistic. The actual waste from technical debt and bad code is probably significantly larger. But technical debt is not only about the financial impact. There's also an established link between a number of significant code smells, brain classes, complex implementations, the kind of stuff we're going to look at later in this session, and security vulnerabilities. So, if we have a, a thing, a problem, technical debt, that we as an industry need to deal with, and it has a significant impact not only on our financial bottom line, but also on security, you would expect technical debt to be really, really high on any decision maker's agenda, right? Is that what's happening? No, not really. And there's actual research on this too, and that research reveals that we developers, we are constantly forced to introduce even more technical depth as companies keep trading code quality for the short-term gains of new features. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. Why is that, that ca the case? Why are we making these trade-offs all the time? And I like to think that it's due to a difference in feedback timing. Because if we think about it, the moment we take a new feature and we put it in the hands of our users, we get a positive reinforcement, right? We get a happy user on the other side, or at least a less angry one, right? The thing is we get an immediate reward by pushing a feature into production. Technical depth, on the other hand, is something that comes with the very delayed feedback, right? So technical depth usually means a slow, slow death, and once we notice the symptoms, it might already be too late. And this difference in feedback timing it's like an open invitation to a decision-making bias known as hyperbolic discounting. And hyperbolic discounting simply means that we humans, we make choices today that our future selves regret. So this is something to keep in the back of your head as you go to a conference party today. Hyperbolic discounting comes from the psychology of addiction. So it's frequently used to explain different addictions like substance abuse and so on. Hyperbolic discounting is also coincidentally the best description I know of why we com as companies keep taking on technical debt. Because just like the addicts, 
we keep trading our future on maintainable code base for the lure of quick fixes and short-time rewards. Or, in the words of Mel Conway, there seems somehow that there's never enough time to do things right, but there's always time to do them over and over again. So, what can we do about this problem? How can we fight the hyperbolic discounting that keeps driving technical debt to accumulate? Well, I like to think that one of the main challenges with software is that it's extremely abstract. Software itself kind of lacks visibility. And consequently, there's no way we can take our software system, pull them out, inspect them, turn them around and see, can we find any technical debt here? There's no way of doing that. And yet, I think that's what we actually need. So what I want us to do now is to look into different ways of visualizing technical left and code quality. And by doing that, I hope that we can finally put code quality pretty high on the business agenda where it needs to be. So before we can go down that route, we have a challenge to solve. Because before we can visualize something, we need to know how to actually measure it, how to quantify it. And Code quality is pretty tricky. So I have to admit that I personally, I tend to avoid the word code quality because it kind of suggests an absolute, whereas reality is way more complicated. And this is very well captured in the following paper that I've taken a lot of inspiration from. So this paper basically states it's that from a measurement theory perspective, the idea that we can measure a multifaceted concept like code quality or code complexity by using one property, it simply doesn't work, right? Code complexity is a multifaceted concept and we're doomed if we're looking for a single number to quantify it. So what I've done instead is that I've taken a lot of inspiration from the second paragraph here, which states that the most promising approach is to identify different aspects of complexity and measure these separately. And this is a concept I've been working on for the past five, six years. I've called it code health. And code health is based on exactly that, that idea. It's an aggregated metric. So what we do here is that we sample 25 factors in the source code. And these 25 factors are known from research to correlate with increased, increased maintenance efforts. So let me show you how this actually works. So first, we have the source code, because this is a file-level metric, code health. And what we do now is we parse the code, and then we look for the presence of different code smells. And these code smells, they come at different levels of abstraction, right? And I just want to give you a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through all 25 factors. But at the module level, you have classics like low cohesion. So who's familiar with low cohesion? Yeah, some of you, like one-tenth maybe, cool. So low cohesion, I like to explain it as a class taking on too many responsibilities. So we stuff too many responsibilities into the same unit. And now that unit is going to be much more complicated to understand because I need to understand multiple different business concepts. It's also the case that once we stuff too many responsibilities in a unit, we also run the risk of unexpected feature interactions, which are some of the worst bugs you can ever have. But of course, we can take any problem and make it even worse. And one way of doing that is by turning a class with low cohesion into a brain class. So brain classes, not only do they have low cohesion, they also tend to be really, really large, and they contain at least one brain method. And a brain method is a function level smell. It's something also known as a gut function, right? And this is something we've probably all seen. So you know that massive method, because brain methods are always really, really long, it's overly complicated, contains a lot of logic, it's really, really hard to follow, and it also tends to centralize the behavior of your module so that each time you want to extend that feature domain, you end up in the brain method, and over time, it grows worse and worse and worse. Then, of course, at the function level, there might also be cop uh, classics like copy-paste logic and so on. And at the implementation level, what I tend to look for are different complexity patterns. And just to give you one example, a pattern that I always look for when assessing the code health is deeply nested logic. So deeply nested logic, that's the case where you have if statements, inside if statements, inside other if statements, and then maybe a for loop for good measure, right? 
the problem with those kind of constructs is that they put a huge cognitive load on us as readers of the code. And consequently, there's some pretty good research done on large-scale systems that show you that roughly 20% of all programming mistakes that we do are due to constructs like deep as the logic, right? So we sample these different code, code health issues. We uh, sum them up and use algorithms to simply aggregate and categorize every single piece of code as being either healthy or unhealthy. So I only use three different categories here for each piece of code. And as always, green is good, because green simply means, it doesn't mean perfect, right? But it means healthy code in the sense that as a developer, you can pick up the piece of code and you're very likely to be able to understand it and extend it safely. Then you have yellow code, and this is code where you have taken on some code smells, right? So the code starts a bit hard to understand, and unless you're really, really careful, you might end up in the red category. A red category simply signals a massive amount of technical depth. This is going to be code that's going to be really risky to work with. And I'm going to support all of these statements with data in just a minute. Now, before I do that, now that we finally know how we can measure our things such as code health, what we can do now is we can finally visualize it. So what I want to show you here is how a code health visualization looks. So this is a real world code base. This is EFROM on uh, open source blockchain implementation. And what you see on screen here is roughly 600,000 lines of code organized into 50 different Git repositories. So the way you interpret this visualization is that each one of these circles that I'm hovering over right now, each one of those represents the code in one Git repo. So if this was a monorepo, each one of those top level circles would simply represent a top level folder. So it's a hierarchical visualization that always follows the structure of your code. It's also interactive, so I can click on any one of these circles and I can zoom in to inspect the details. And once I get to a lowest level of detail, I see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle. And you see that those bubbles, they have different size, right? So the size of the circle just reflects the number of lines of code, because that kind of gives us a quick idea on how big the potential problem is. The important thing here is the color, which visualizes the code help category. So we see here two pieces of green and one piece of red code. Now, I'm a big, big fan of visualizations because visualizations tap into one of the most powerful pattern detectors that we have in the known universe, the human brain. We are really, really good at spotting patterns in visualizations. And that makes it possible for us to very quickly compare different projects, maybe different products in our portfolio, right? And I want to show you an example here of just two code bases that you might be familiar with. The one to the left is React, a UI library from Facebook, extremely popular these days. So let, let's check, how many of you are using React today to build your applications? Wow, so it's like one third of you, cool. So this is what you have under the hood. Now, what can we say about React without even looking at the source code? Well, we can see that most of the code tends to be green or yellow. I mean, we could say it looks pretty okay, but there's one thing that concerns me, and that's that cluster of red code in the React Reconciler package. Now, if I work on React, this is important information to me because it's going to constrain what I can actually do with that system, right? The moment I touch Re React Reconciler, I know that I'm in for some red code. So this might be problematic. What I want you to do now is to contrast React to the code base on the right. And that's CoreCLR, the .NET runtime from Microsoft. And CoreCLR, it's a massive, massive code base. So what you see on screen there is more than 8 million lines of code. So that's a lot of code. And we can quickly see that CoreCLR, from a code health perspective, looks to be in a little bit worse shape than React, right? So you see all that red code there? It looks like a Petri dish gone mad or something, right? So the question is now, how do I deal with that? If I have 8 million lines of code and s several millions that are red, what do I do with that information? Towards the, the end of this session, I'm going to show you how I prioritize red code, depending on the impact it has on us. But before we go there, we need to connect this to something that actually means something to the business. Because being able to draw these green and red colors, that's all nice. But if we want to get the attention from our management, from our leaders, then we need to put some actual numbers on this. 
And the reason I think this is important is because I've spent more than three decades writing code. And during those years, I heard so many people claim that code quality is important. Everyone in the industry seems to kind of agree on that. Yet, the moment a deadline hits the fan, code quality is the first thing to fly out of the window, right? And consequently, and one of the reasons for that is because historically, no one has ever established the link between code quality and the business. And that makes it far too easy to dismiss code quality as some kind of technical concern. So what I want us to do now is to move away from knowing within quotation marks that code quality is important to actually knowing it. And to do this, me and a colleague, Mr. Marcus Borg, we set out to perform a large scale study on actual code bases. So what we did here was that we collected data from 39 different companies. They gave us access to their source code and we simply measured the code health of every single module. What we also did was that we collected a lot of data on what are the lead times for implementing a new feature, what happens when you do that, how many of those implementations come back as defects and so on. I'm going to talk about that very soon. And we also made sure to include uh, code bases from many, many different industry segments because we wanted to make sure that the findings that we present here, that they aren't unique to a specific uh, industry like automobile, that this is something that actually generalizes to software in general. And for the very same reason, we made sure to include code written in 14 different programming languages. So we had code in C++, Java, Go, JavaScript, Python, all the mainstream languages, because again, we wanted to make sure that this is something that generalizes. And before I go into the results, I want to point out that um, the actual paper is uh, peer reviewed, was presented at the International Conference on Technical Debt. So what I'm going to show you here is that all these findings are statistically significant, and that basically means that there seems to be some real signal in the data. It's not just a statistical fluke. All right. Before looking at the results, I want to make sure that we all know what we see. So to assess the business impact of code quality, we uh, simply wanted to measure what's the time in development and how is that impacted by the various code health categories. And what we also wanted to do is we wanted to avoid putting any administrative overhead on the developers at those companies that participate in the study. So we decided to try to measure the time in de development automatically. And the way we did this was by piecing together Jira data with version control data from Git. And I just want to walk you through the algorithm very quickly. So basically what we did was that the moment you as a developer take a card in Jira and you pull it to an in-progress state, that's where we start the clock. And then at some point you do a commit referencing that card and that's where we stop the clock. And if your story is done now, then your time in development was time between the card moving to in-progress to the first commit. Simple, right? Of course, in reality, many stories require multiple commits to multiple files. So what we do in that case is that we simply continue to calculate the time between commits. And at the end, we simply piece them together. And that meant that by following this algorithm, what we had now was that we had a massive data set containing um, tens of thousands of modules, each one with a known code health score, each one uh, with the time and development for all the features that had that touched that file. And since we had Jira, we could also figure out if it was a bug fix or if it was a feature. Did I manage to explain that? Cool, some of you are nodding, I really like that. Good, good. So, what did we find out? Does code quality actually matter? It does, otherwise this would be a very short talk. <laughs> so, the first thing we did was that we looked at what's the average time it takes to implement a feature or fixing a bug, depending on code health category. And what we found here is pretty interesting, we found that Implementing a feature in green code is more than twice as quick as implementing a similar scoped feature in red code. Why is this relevant to a business? Well, this basically represents speed to market. So if we as a company would have red code and it, we can add a new capability in let's say two months and our competitors having green code, they could basically get exactly the same thing in less than a month it's going to be virtually impossible for us to keep up. So already here, we can see that 
code quality is vital to a business, right? It's speed to market. But I also have to admit that these results, they didn't really surprise me. This is pretty much what I would have expected after spending all that time writing code myself. What did surprise me though, was the second thing we looked at. So what we did now was that we kind of uh, acknowledged that averages can be a little bit misleading and actually hide the real problem with red code. So what we did in the next part of the study was that instead of looking at the averages, we looked at what's the longest time it can take to implement something, depending on code health category, right? So we looked more at the variation than the averages. And what we found here is pretty interesting. Now, first of all, we see that for green code, the actual numbers there are pretty close to the average. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that making a code change to green code is pretty predictable. It will take roughly the same time each time you do it. But we see that for red code, that relationship no longer holds. In fact, changes to red code can take up to an order of magnitude longer than green code. So how is this relevant to a business? Well, I like to say that what this represents is actually uncertainty. And trust me on this one, within software, no one likes uncertainty, right? So I'm currently working as a CTO, and if we would have red code, that would, would put me in problem. Because now, let's say I promise something to a customer, maybe I promise something to you that, yeah, you know, we're going to have this feature ready in a month. But if my code is red, I can make no such promise because it could actually take nine or even 10 months. So at the end of the day, I would look really, really bad. And not only that, that would put a huge stress on the whole organization. If I instead take on my developer hat, I also dislike red code. I dislike uncertainty, because uncertainty is what's causing me stress over time and missed deadlines. Now, last thing I want to show you with the, from this study is that since we had the gyro access and we collected this data on uh, defects and defect densities, that also made it possible to establish a link between code health and correctness. So what we did here was that we looked at the number of defects depending on code health category. And what we found out was that red code can have on average 15 times more defects than green code. Is this relevant to a business? I like to think so for two reasons. First of all, if you have red code, all those defects, they are going to impact the whole product maturity experience. They're going to impact your customer satisfaction. And that's important enough. The other problem with the defect density of red code is that what's going to happen with those defects? You know that just like in the Stephen King movie, they are going to come back. And they're going to come back in the shape of unplanned work. And as Gene Kim told us, unplanned work is the silent killer of all IT projects. And I've seen uh, companies that I worked with, they have like 60, 70% of their workday being unplanned work. And you can imagine how stressful that is. It's going to be virtually impossible to keep any commitment if 60% of your work is something you cannot anticipate upfront. So red code has severe consequences for both speed to market as well as the quality of what gets delivered. But how does it impact us as developers? Well, I'd like to recommend a book to you. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's called uh, Rethinking Productivity in Software Engineering. It's a collection of research papers. And there's one paper in here that I enjoyed a little bit extra. And that's a paper that looked at developer happiness. Because guess what? Happy developers seem to be productive developers. Right? Not a big surprise, we're humans too. But what's so interesting is that in this paper, they actually looked at what makes us developers unhappy. And what, what I want to show you now are the top three reasons for unhappiness amongst developers. Reason number one, we developers, we strongly dislike to being stuck in problem solving. And given what we just saw about red code, it's very easy to see how this could happen. So let's imagine that we do a daily stand-up or something like that, right? And we hear that, hey, there was a crash in production. We really, really need to prioritize this and fix it. 
you jump on the problem because you're familiar with this particular area, so you volunteer, I, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to investigate it. And it's probably going to be a quick fix, right? Let's say you can wrap it up in two hours. It seems like a simple problem. However, your investigation leads you into red code. And once you're in red code, as we have seen, all bets are off. So pretty soon, you're going to start to feel the time pressure, right? And that tr time pressure is going to spread to the whole organization because, hey, you have a crash in production, right? And you thought you could fix it in a couple of hours, but now it's already been 10 days. So it's going to be extremely stressful. And that's probably one of the main reasons for number three here, that we developers, we strongly dislike to work with bad code. In fact, there, there's this wonderful quote that we developers, we suffer tremendously. We have to work with code, bad code, that should have been avoided in the first place. And that's like the textbook definition of technical debt. Now, now that we have covered the theory and we know the costs and risk of red code, how can we use this data? How can we put it into our daily workflows? Well, there are a couple of use cases I've seen work really well that I would like to share with you. The first use case is that I've, one that I think is extremely important, and that is the case that code quality, as we have seen, it's going to constrain the business. It's going to constrain what you can do with the product. And one of the big wins of having this data, and in particular if we manage to visualize it like this, is that now we can actually have everyone, not only we engineers, but also product people and our managers, everyone can have the same situational awareness of what the system looks like, where the strong parts are and where the weak parts are. And by doing that, we can finally start to fight hyperbolic discounting. Because the way you fight hyperbolic discounting is by priming decision makers to think about future risks. Because only then are they going to act upon them, right? So now you know if you, this happens to be your code base and you're planning to do some massive investment into, let's say, React Reconciler, you have 15 significant features planned there and you see that you have all this red code, then you can start to think about the risk of that uncertainty inherent in that code, right? And that's going to prime you to make the right decisions. Now, finally, and uh, the thing I personally like the most about this data is that it makes it possible for us, finally, to build a business case for improvements and large-scale refactorings. Because refactorings can now actually come with the business expectation. So just to give you an example, let's say that you identify some code here that's red. What you can do now is that you can actually promise that, you know, if we take this red code and we make it green by refactoring, what we're going to do is that we're going to be able to move twice as quick in that part of the code in the future. And you see you have 10 things planned on your roadmap that touches that area. As a bonus, you're also going to reduce the uncertainty with an order of magnitude, and you're going to have fewer defects. It's going to be pretty hard to say no to, don't you think? So, with that covered, I still have a couple of minutes to go, so what I'd like to do now is to return to this challenge that I kind of just skimmed over earlier, and that's the challenge of massive amounts of red code. I'd like to illustrate that in uh, Core CLR, so Core CLR, just to repeat that, it's more than 8 million lines of code. And if we sum up just the red areas of it, we probably have like 2, 2.5 million lines of red code. I mean, how do you deal with that amount of risk? Do you just refactor all that code? How long would it take? Three years? And that's the problem, right? We always need to balance improvements with delivering new stuff. Because if we stop doing features for a couple of years, you would probably be out of business. You would be Netscape, and that's a, net, a good thing. So what can we do here? Well, we can take inspiration from another thing that I call behavioral code analysis. And this is something I wrote about in Software Design X-Rays. A behavioral code analysis basically means that we approach code from the people side, from the behavioral side. And in a behavior code analysis, the code itself, if it's red or green, that's important. But it's even more important to understand how we, as a development organization, interact with the code, code we're building. And to pull this off, the first thing we need is a behavioral data source. So how can we track developer behavior? That sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? 
but it's not because you're already doing it. You're probably just not thinking about it as behavioral data. Because what I'm talking about is this, version control, git. And I kind of find it fascinating that over decades, we as developers, we have used, used version control more or less as an overly complicated backup system, and then occasionally as a collaboration tool. But the, by doing so, we have built up this absolutely wonderful data source over how our system evolved. And what I like in particular when it comes to technical depth is that version control data gives us a time dimension into our code base. So we can figure out when we, when we worked on each piece of code and how frequently. And this is data that we can use to prioritize technical depth. So let me show you how that works. So what you see on screen here is a different visualization of core CLR. It's the same visualization style, right? So each one of these bubbles, they still uh, represent a particular file in that system. The only difference is the color, because the colors now reflect the change frequency of that code. That is, how many commits have we done to that piece of code over the past year? And what's so interesting about the, uh, this change frequency, it's something I call hotspots, because by counting the change frequency of each piece of code, we can detect where the development hotspots are, the parts of the code where we spend most of our time. And that, in turn, makes it possible to draw the distinction between low interest technical depth. I mean, you see an example here, I'm probably hiding it, but you see an example here to your right. So you have a large chunk of code there, several million lines of code, and we see that there's virtually no development activity in that part of the code. So that means that even if we have red code there, it, that might be a future risk that we want to know about, but it's probably not an urgent problem because we are, that code seems to be stable. We're virtually not doing any development work in that part of the code. On the other hand, we see a cluster of red modules here to the left, and any technical depth in that part of the code is going to be high interest technical depth because each one of those changes that we do is going to be more risky and expensive. Now, hotspots help a lot in kind of narrowing down a pretty big system to a few actionable starting points, but sometimes not even hotspots are enough. And just to show you that example, if you look at this particular hotspot in uh, CoreCLR, it's a C++ file called gentry.cpp, and it consists of 14,000 lines of code. Not only that, it's 14,000 lines of C++ that looks like this. So let me ask you, how many of you are C++ developers? Not that many of us, a couple. So I also did C++, I used to do C++ for 10 years, and I know what the rest of you are thinking, those are 10 years I never get back. <laughs> but what I mean with that is that I have a lot of respect for code that looks like this, and I'm certainly not jealous at the archaeologists of the future, right? It's going to be a harder nut to crack than even the hieroglyphs. And imagine having 14,000 lines of code like that. Where do you start? It's going to take me months to refactor that. It's going to be a huge risk. So when I come across these really complex hotspots, what I do is I use a technique called X-ray. So a hotspot X-ray works like this, that you take each one of those modules, you parse them into separate functions, then you look at your Git log and you see where do each commit hit over time, and you sum them up so that you get hotspots at the function level. And this is something we can use to find an actionable starting point for our refactorings without taking on a huge risk. So let's look at the data from gentry.cpp. So here's the actual x-ray analysis. And what we see here is that the number one hotspot at the function level is a function called gt clone expression. And we can see that gt clone expression has been modified 42 times just over the past year. So like, if we have any technical depth in that function, like almost once a week, some developers impacted and are unhappy due to that code, right? And we also see uh, in the column to the right called cyclomatic complexity. So before I go into that, how many of you are familiar with cyclomatic complexity? So it's like plenty of you, maybe half. So very quick summary. Cyclomatic complexity is one of these really, really old complexity measures from the 1970s. And the way it works is basically that it's a function level metric. So what you do is you count the number of logical paths through that function, meaning that each time you come across an if statement, plus one, each time you have a loop, plus one, and so on, right? Then you sum them up. And for reference, 
the original paper defines very high complexity as being 15. Here we have almost 10 times that, right? And the reason I personally use cyclomatic complexity because it's not a particularly good complexity number, but it's very good at one thing. It's a very good estimate on the minimum number of unit tests you would need to cover just that function. So 112 unit tests, that sure says something, right? What's interesting is that if we look in the column in the middle, we see that we have roughly 500 lines of code. And 500 lines of code for a single function, that's a lot, isn't it? It is, it is. But 500 lines of code is much less than 14,000 lines of code, which was size of a total hotspot. And 500 lines of code is definitely less than 8 million lines of code, which was size of a total code base. So more important, we're now at the point where we can do a focused refactoring based on data from how we, as an organization, interact with the code we're building. So at the end of the day, I like to view hotspots as sending a positive message. Hotspots explain why we don't have to fix all our technical debt. And what I'm going to show you now is probably the most important graph in this talk. Because what you see here on the x-axis is each file in the system, and they are sorted according to the strange frequency, that is how many commits have you done to that file. And the number of commits is what you see on the y-axis. And as you see here, this particular code base, that distribution shows a power law distribution. And this is not something that's unique to Core CLR or React. This is something I have found in every single code base that I've ever analyzed, and I've probably analyzed around three, 400 code bases by now. So this seems to be the way software evolves. And this is important to us because, again, what it means is that most of our code is going to be in the long tail. So that's code that's rarely, if ever, touched. And that's the part of the code where we actually can live with a certain degree of technical depth. The hotspots, on the other hand, are at the head of the curve. Those are the parts of the code where we have so much development activity that even a minor amount of technical depth or code quality issues are going to be really, really expensive, right? So using hotspots, you can usually take a large system and narrow it down to maybe just 2 3% of the total code base. And that's the part of the code where it's really, really important for, to have green code. So, what I wanted to show you in this session was that to address this massive challenge of technical depth, we actually need two different representations, two different views on the problem. First of all, we need some kind of quality dimension that tells us how severe is the particular problem. But we cannot just use static data from uh, the source code. We also need to complement that with the impact. And what I want to show you today is how code health and hotspots go together to help us identify high interest technical depth. And about the code red findings, during all those years I spent in the software industry, I had so many people that have been telling me, no, no, we don't have time to refactor. No, we don't have time to automate tests. No, we don't have time to rethink our architecture. And somehow, a lot of people in the industry have this, this idea that there is some kind of trade-off between speed and quality, right? But what we find in the Code Red research, and this pretty much echoes the message from uh, Dora, is that there doesn't seem to be any such trade-off. In fact, what our data indicate is that the contrary seems to be true. In order to go fast, we also need to go really, really well. And I like to think that Given that in a healthy code base you can have twice the speed when implementing new features or fixing bugs, you can reduce uncertainty with an order of magnitude and you can have 15 times fewer defects. I like to think that the business impact of code quality is going to be unmistakably clear. Now, I hope that this session has inspired you to dive deeper into this topic. And uh, when it comes to the Code Red papers, there are actually two papers. So the first is a uh, white paper that's a little bit more accessible, includes all the data from uh, this talk. The second one is the actual research paper. It's also publicly available, contains all the details and uh, how we handled all the possible biases in the data. And finally, the tool I've been using to do the research and to do these visualizations is uh, CodeScene. So if you're interested in checking out what color your own code has, then please go to codescene.com and try it out. 
Now, if you want to read on hotspots and all these other behavioral co-analysis techniques, then I would recommend checking out software design x-rays. I'll be hanging around for the rest of the day and be happy to mingle with you and answer any questions you have, and also be happy to take questions now. Before I do that, I really, really just want to take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me, and may the code be with you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Adam? Hands everywhere. Okay. Fantastic talk, Adam. Thank you. Do you have any evidence that, coming out to code health, that uh, less healthy code gets even less healthy over time? And is that then a, is, does that then mean it's not the code, it's the developers that are causing the problem? That's uh, super interesting. So I um, remember I read a really, really good book a couple of years ago called A Pragmatic Programmer. And there was this um, idea with a broken window. So how many of you are familiar with the broken window theory? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And that's something I see in code as well. And I actually have some data for that. I've wrote a lot about it in software and x-rays that once code turns bad, it kind of just continues on that slope. And code uh, deteriorates much more frequently than it's being refactored. And one of the things that surprised me a lot with technical depth was that I always had this idea that code starts out pretty, pretty good, but then something happens, and that something is usually a deadline, right? And we take on technical depth, and from then it, there it's downhill. But what the research tells us is that technical depth usually starts already in the very first iteration on that piece of code. So that's why a lot of my focus these days is to kind of prevent, present as early feedback as possible because I think that the earlier we can catch these problems, the easier it is to act upon them. Because once the technical depth there is there, it's going to be extremely challenging to reverse that trend. And for the second part of your question, is it a problem with the programmers? I mean, one thing I'm looking into right now, because we want to do a follow-up study to the Code Red paper, because what I'm in particular interested in understanding is uh, what about this uncertainty in red code? Can you remember that? An order of magnitude longer uncertainty. What I think uh, part of that cost comes from is actually an onboarding cost. Because understanding existing code is extremely challenging. Understanding existing code that we didn't write ourselves is one of the hardest tasks humanity have ever attempted. And I do think that a lot of that uncertainty is due to the fact that different people are doing their work. Because we have probably all seen these code bases, right? We have some code that's virtually impossible for anyone to understand except the person who wrote it, right? So that that person becomes a bottleneck each time they want to fix the code. So um, what we're trying to do now is to establish, is there a link between uh, the experience of the people uh, in general and uh, in particular parts of the code? and uh, risk and uncertainty. So next time I get back here, I hope I have a really good answer to that question. Next question here. Hey, um, did any of the languages perform better or worse than each other? <laughs> uh, that's a wonderful question. If I answer it, uh, some of you might kill me. Uh, well, there are, there are different perspectives. If you look at research, uh, there is really no such link, right? Perhaps because it hasn't been studied so deeply, but you don't really find that there are any variations. We didn't find that in our data either. What we did find, however, was there are huge differences in the type of code smells you take on in different languages. And this is knowledge, so I'm going to reveal one of my secrets I use when putting together an article or a talk is that depending on what type of problem with software I want to illustrate, I Google for different type of languages. So if I want to show a code that's misusing design patterns, that's overly abstract, I Google GitHub trending Java. If I instead look for a really, really messy implementation, then I take a safe bet and go for C++. If I want to look for uh, misuse of mock frameworks and overly abstract tests, that are tightly coupled to the implementation, then I go for C-sharp. So I like to think that there are different code smells, but at the end of the day, 
uh, we can kind of see that there's no difference in code health across implementation languages. Hope that answered your question. Okay, next question here. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk, it was very insightful. Um, if you had a team of five developers and a new project and not a single line of code, what would be your best practice to start from day one? And that can be any, any best practice. So I think it's really, really important to um, have these techniques as part of your regular workflow. So by doing that, you make sure that everyone in the team has shared situation awareness of where your hotspots are, what's happening to them, what's our code health overall. So what I always recommend is to make these techniques part of your uh, recurring activities, right? If you sit down and you do a planning meeting or priority meeting, bring up a visualization of your code base and see are there any risks I need to be aware of, anything I need to fix. And also, uh, use this data as part of your team's retrospectives. Because I think if you do that, then uh, you're already doing better than so many other companies in the industry. And the reason I think you need this from the beginning is that I've seen so many companies that start out with a legacy migration project. So they have this code base, and legacy in this case just means that it's code we didn't write ourselves. And now we're going to re-implement that system, and this time everything's going to be perfect. However, what very often happens is that that usually moves, well, uh, moves along well for a couple of months, and then something happens, and that something is almost always a deadline. So it might be that you have a demo or you have an important stakeholder that wants to see something or it's a proof of concept. And it usually means that you're going to try to fast track certain user uh, visible features. And I've seen so many code bases that kind of just takes a code half hit and they never recover from that, right? So I think that using these techniques regularly from the where we start is a big, big help. Still two minutes for another question. Thank you for the talk, that was really good. Um, so we're aware for the fact that you know, code goes red often as a sh because short, uh, taking shortcuts, deadlines. Did your research look at all into how much extra time it actually takes to keep a code base green while working on a feature or to create a new feature on, on a new code base and make it green rather than red? So what's the extra hit you take up front to keep something in a green state versus just rushing it and letting it go red? Uh, interesting, so I, uh, we actually, we don't have any data on it. I uh, haven't measured it. And uh, I mean, the only thing I can do is I can offer a guess. And my guess is that it's actually not more expensive to maintain code in a green state than uh, to take on technical debt. I think that a lot of times those uh, technical left shortcuts, they're not even saving us time to the initial delivery. Right? I think many times they're just uh, guesses and uh, speculations that end up in the end to take just as long as it would have taken to do it properly. Uh, but if anyone is familiar with any work in that area, then please point it my way. I'd be really interested. I think there was so much enthusiasm for questions. One more, last one. Um, there's hands everywhere, I'm sorry, Tessidia. Uh, I'm reading between the lines, it sounds like you also looked at code health over time as a, a trend. Were there any other interesting um, patterns you were taking from that? You mentioned that you know red tends to get redder or stay red if there, um, there's no investment in it. Were there any other trends over time that in the insights you got from that? Yeah, that's right. So in general, I'm pretty much a fan of uh, trends over absolute values because to me, trends are actionable. So uh, one thing we did with CodeSyn, for example, is CodeSyn has a bunch of things like uh, different quality gates and whatnot, but we're never firing off a quality gate just because you have red code. We're firing off a quality gate when you make red code worse or green code worse, because the earlier you can catch things, the better. So trends are always actionable, and the reason I say this is because I spend a lot of time talking to C-level managers in different companies, trying to convince them to kind of, um, or coach them on how to handle our tech debt. And um, one pretty easy win there is that if you focus on trends, you can always say that um, no one ever wants your code to be worse tomorrow than it is today, right? 
So to me, step zero when managing technical debt is not about uh, refactoring, improving stuff. It's just putting a quality bar on what's already there. Don't take on more technical debt unless you have it under control. So that's uh, one of the patterns I saw. Another one that might be quite controversial is that uh, what this data also shows us is that it's actually okay to take on technical debt in the tail, in the long tail, right, of our hotspot curve. And this is something that I've been very careful with uh, recommending because it's so easy to misuse. Like, hey, this crazy Swede told me it's okay. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, right? But once we have this visibility, once we have this situation awareness, we can actually start to use technical debt in the way it was meant originally, right? We can take it on, we know what we're doing, we know the consequences of it, and we might not even have to pay it back if it continues to be stable. Cool. So please catch me during a break. I'd be happy to continue the discussions. Thank you very much.